Now I'd like to introduce uh, Michael Matias, whom some of you may know, probably most of you know. Um, he did work on facade, which was his um, sort of proof of concept of some of the uh, AI research that he's been doing. And he leads the Center for Games and Playable Media. And he will tell you, um, actually, I'm not sure I haven't seen this talk yet. But <laughs> anyways, uh, Michael Matias. All right, so um, yeah, I want to continue on the themes that Chancellor Blumenthal was discussing about the role of games research um, in the interactive entertainment industry. So, you know, what is the role of the university, or what should be the role of the university in games and playable media? Certainly, schools produce students, right? And these students go and work in industry and invent, you know, uh, new genres and sort of keep keep the sort of ever fresh creativity and optimism uh, that is in uh, that, that is in the games industry. But this isn't really enough. If you look at the mission of the research university, what we're supposed to be doing is engaging in cutting edge research, sort of furthering the boundaries of knowledge then having those same professors who are working at the forefront of their discipline teaching students and you know producing students who go out into industry and start their own companies and so forth and finally and most fundamentally we're supposed to be impacting society um, including industry uh, and by bringing sort of groundbreaking and game-changing innovations uh, to society so in many other fields, um, this has been, you know, this has become sort of routine. You know, we have many examples of industries in which this kind of university research and kind of groundbreaking, uh, uh, groundbreaking innovation has spawned whole new industries and continued to um, have a strong university industry relationship. For example, the invention of the internet. The fundamental theory of packet switching was developed in the university. The ARPANET, the predecessor to the internet, was run by universities. Protocols such as TCPIP, the first web browser, the earliest search engines, as well as the page rank algorithm behind Google were all developed in universities. Genome sequencing technology was developed by universities. This paved the way for the genomics revolution and helped enable the biotech in uh, industry. Rich and fruitful collaborations between industry and academia continue to this day with universities routinely contributing groundbreaking research. Um, the green energy revolution, uh, fundamental advances in photovoltaics, biofuels, and wind energy have taken place in universities. Large industry academia consortia are currently collaborating on advances that will fundamentally change our society and our relationship to energy. So what's games research uh, role in this? Well, unfortunately, games research is sometimes considered an oxymoron. Um, it's, uh, 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 there, there's sometimes an attitude that the only valid activity um, in game production and in, in, in game research is working on something that's shipping soon, right? And to some degree, this sort of, if you're not working on something shipping, uh, you're wasting your time attitude uh, does make some sense. Because unlike the previous examples, the internet, biotech, and green energy, games are media, right? And so like work in film or dance or theater, progress is made and has to be made by creating things that audiences experience. So how can we engage in the sort of long-term pushes that create new kinds of experiences that can't be done incrementally while still keeping this sort of audience-facing, experience-facing focus? Let's look at the games research landscape and, and sort of currently how games research is structured in academia. Um, one of the sort of largest and most established, established genres of games research is really game studies. And what game studies does is um, it borrows and adapts uh, frameworks and theories um, and approaches from other disciplines, disciplines such as media studies, philosophy, anthropology, architecture, semiotics, psychology, the list goes on and on, um, looks at games through these adapted lenses from other disciplines in order to give us new insights into how games function as media. Uh, another major focus or form of games research is design research. In design research, what you're doing is uh, engaging in kind of design experimentation 
to create new genres of experiences that uh, haven't been made yet. And of course, design research is uh, informed by uh, the analysis and understandings that come out of game studies, as well as by other disciplines. And you know, they result in the production of new experimental games, which then can be subject to game studies, and we have sort of a, a virtuous loop that continues. Then there's a, a third kind of research, and I represent it as a much smaller um, uh, bubble, because right now it's underrepresented in academic research, which is computational media research. And what is computational media work about? Well, this is about uh, work that um, creates technologies and frameworks and idioms that fundamentally change the computational and material conditions for the creation of games. Uh, another way of saying that is this is work that creates um, uh, new kind of tools and approaches that allow you to make games that you couldn't even think of making using the tools and approaches today. Now this has to be done in tight collaboration with design research. It's design and work on these sort of fundamental enabling technologies together. Um, so let's look a little more at what this means, uh, creating tools and technologies and idioms that change the material and computational conditions for game creation. Consider the, the lowly uh, cup of broken crayons, right? If you uh, um, ask for coloring supplies at a restaurant, um, this will be often what you're supplied with. Um, if you're given these tools, you know, that this, this gives you sort of certain conditions and possibilities for the kinds of images that you can create. Um, so if you have your broken cup of crayons, you can produce a lot of beautiful uh, images, and I and my daughter do, um, but you're not going to make this, right? Um, the cup of broken crayons won't allow you to execute this, and even more important, if all you've ever seen are images and all you've ever, ever produced and seen in your whole life are images produced by your sort of broken crayon cup, you won't even be able to conceive of this image, right, let alone execute it. And sort of more deeply, you certainly won't be able to manage the possibilities of carving stone based on thinking, uh, based on your experience with the cup of crayons, right? That requires completely different tools to have the affordances to do that. So let's uh, think about the kind of game design space, right? This is something a number of uh, uh, speakers and thinkers have done over the years, is to think about this kind of imagined space of all possible games, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, along this surface, you have uh, all possible games that can be created um, or ever could be created. Uh, and then the height here is corresponding to some kind of, you know, fitness, like basically how effective the game functions um, in its cultural context. All right, so this circle could be the region of the design space we've explored today. And as we engage in sort of incremental experimentation, we um, expand this region of sort of possible conceivable games. But there are potential games in this design space that um, we don't really know how to reach today, right? So one would be interactive drama that kind of holodeck dream of rich autonomous characters that you can interact with in sort of open-ended scenarios, and yet the scenario dynamically shapes itself into um, a, a well-formed plot arc. Or the dynamically game-mastered MMO or ARG, right? multiplayer games in which sort of a behind-the-scenes dungeon master can, um, or game master, can orchestrate the activities of hundreds of thousands or millions of people based on their social interactions um, to create rich and engaging and emergent possibilities for groups who are playing, right? And that's something you couldn't do. You could say, well, we'll have human beings dynamically game master an MMO or ARG, um, but that doesn't work. That doesn't scale for creating experiences that are really receptive to the social interactions of millions of people. Or um, from uh, Diamond Age, the notion of a young lady's illustrated primer. You know, this, this is basically uh, an object you carry around with you that observes and knows about your life, right? It knows deeply about you, and it actually generates games. It creates games just for you that are relevant to the particular conditions that you as an individual find yourself in, right? These are, these are, conceptual games that are somewhere in this design space, um, how do we get to them? 
If we start trying to move out from the gains that we know how to make today towards these distant peaks, um, it turns out that these, uh, these, these gains, these distant peaks, um, aren't incrementally reachable, right? This would again be like trying to carve uh, Michelangelo's David with, um, uh, with the broken crayons. Like you just can't carve stone with crayons, right? You need some fundamentally different kinds of tools, technologies, and techniques. And really what computational media research is about is sort of annexing these new, these regions of design space into the design space. In some sense, it's as if these peaks, such as interactive drama, or this dynamically game mastered MMO, or the Young Ladies Illustrated Primer, um, aren't even in the design space yet, right? <laughs> it's sort of, uh, they're not places you can reach yet. And computational media research, the job of computational media research is to sort of add these new possibilities to the space. So if we think about that kind of technical research, um, the most obvious examples um, in sort of, you know, technical advances in games have involved improvements in graphical fidelity, right? So from the original Space War, you know, through to the introduction of rapid 3D texture mapping in Doom, to near photorealistic 3D environments found in contemporary games such as Crisis 2, there's been this steady progress in making games look better and better. And that's sort of like, you know, the, the, in a sense, like the single existence proof that people tend to point at that technological research, you know, does impact game creation. But let's think for a moment about what graphics as sort of a, as a representational trope, in a sense, are really about. What are computer graphics really about? Um, what they sort of fundamentally allow you to represent are the notions of movement, collision detection, and physics, right? Simulated physical interaction. And 3D graphics are in some sense about uh, Renaissance perspective, operationalizing the sort of hard-won tips, uh, tricks, and techniques developed by artists in the Renaissance to represent 3D space. So, so graphics kind of give us, you know, as we do all this work on graphical improvements, we're getting better and better at sort of uh, depicting and representing through interactive media movement, collision detection, physics, and 3D perspective. What about communicating everything else, right? There's a whole lot more that we want to say in games besides, uh, hey, look, things move in the world, right? What about um, the rest of human nature? You know, what about moral conundrums? What about emotional relationships with characters? What about betrayal? What about meditation, since Tracy's here? Um, uh, this is, you know, how do we go about sort of computationally representing this huge space of everything it means to be human? A way to think about the sort of current limitations in our sort of concept of, of, uh, of content authoring in games today is to really think about um, uh, the current conditions of content authoring. And the current conditions of content authoring are really the notion of kind of lovingly handcrafting content, right? Of extremely skilled kind of artists and writers um, working to create, uh, uh, working to create content that through its loving, sort of handcrafted, beautiful nature conveys meaning in the game. And we're sort of, um, familiar with these typically kind of handcrafted assets in games. They, I mean, they include sort of models and, uh, sound and music and voice acting and animation, uh, but it also includes things like levels and scenario progressions, right? There's a lot of sort of this lovingly handcrafted content that we put into games that isn't really fundamentally computationally represented, but is in some sense layered on top of the computational representation. One issue with this sort of handcrafted approach is that it has trouble scaling. And, you know, why does scaling matter? Well, as you try to make the content that you're representing more and more open to um, variability through player interaction and through player agency, you end up having to produce an exponential amount of this content, right? And that exponential production of content to respond to player interaction just doesn't scale. So that kind of handcrafting ends up fundamentally li limiting interaction and gameplay. 
Um, you know, here we have sort of the, a cartoon version of a finite state machine for, you know, kind of a, a simplified adventure. Um, but this kind of sort of hand branching structure um, actually underlies a lot of the game progressions that we create today. You know, and this really is sort of, you know, uh, 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 you know, really not even a step up from the choose your own adventure game or the choose your own adventure book. Um, that a lot of our uh, game production is really engaged in the sort of, you know, attempt, a, attempt to handcraft, you know, a large number of possibilities in a sort of choose your own adventure fashion, um, where a lot of our procedurality is sitting in graphics, right? We don't have to handcraft like every um, angle from which you might view a character in a game, right? Those are actually dynamically and procedurally uh, uh, created for us by a 3D uh, graphics engine. But as we try to sort of um, represent everything else that's not movement, collision detection, physics, and uh, 3D perspective, we often fall back on this kind of handcrafting um, and manual branching. Now, and if we think about one of the earliest games, Pong, uh, it quickly becomes evident uh, the limits of this approach. Um, imagine if Pong had been done as sort of a choose-your-own-adventure, right? Um, and, uh, and actually, you can go, if you want to Google Paper Pong, uh, you can find this online. Uh, someone has uh, created you know, sort of about 250-page Pong game, uh, where here, you know, in, in, in the uh, um, upper left-hand corner, you know, you turn to page 114 to move up, and turn to page 117 to move down. So I turn to page 117. Oh, look, the ball is a little closer. Um, well, now I turn to page, uh, it looks like 125, um, to move down again. Well, now the ball is even closer, and I'm further down the screen. And now uh, both directions say turn to page 25. And of course, we all know what's on page 25. Game over, right? <laughs> So, um, you know, this quickly shows the kind of absurdity of uh, that kind of handcrafted approach to, in this case, physics representation. You know, this would be what would happen if we applied that same sort of scripting approach to physics. And what Pong really did, um, one of its uh, innovations, was to represent procedurally, computationally, a very simple model of physics that allowed sort of a huge number of state possibilities, depending on where you hit the ball on the paddle, how the paddle was moving when you hit the ball, um, you know, encoded uh, something roughly like Snell's law, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection for how the ball bounces off the paddle. Um, and, um, you know, that kind of model, having an underlying computational and procedural model, allowed Pong to escape the bonds of scripting. So if we think about kind of what should computational media research be doing, in some sense, it's this move towards procedural everything, right? What Pong did with physics, we want to do, um, and computational media research should be striving towards doing for the rest of all content you would want to represent about the human experience. You know, and, and why do we want to do that? Well, the unique property of games as a medium, what, what really sort of separates them and makes them different from all other media before, is that they communicate through systems, right? That, that's, that, that, that when a game is communicating its content, its message, um, its theme, through the emergent possibilities of a complex and vast state space, that is, um, un that, that is uh, enabled by an underlying system, that's sort of when a game is really, you know, operating at its best, when it's uniquely, um, when it's engaging in the powerful and unique kind of communication that games can engage in. You know, so just as graphics technology has enabled computational models that make movement, collision detection, and physics playable, we need research to make all the rest of human experience everything that's currently statically represented in games, playable. As a, um, sort of a concrete example of one you know, step in that direction, um, in, in work that uh, we're doing in the Center for Games and Playable Media, I want to talk briefly about Prom Week, um, which is available um, to play with uh, outside, so please check it out um, in, the, in the demo session. So Prom Week is a high school social interaction simulator <laughs> to some degree, right? Um, so you have a cast of characters, you know, they have traits, 
They have kind of status effects on them. They can be jealous of people. They can be embarrassed. They can be angry towards someone. These statuses come and go. Um, and then there's an underlying kind of social network of connections between the characters. How much friendship one character feels towards another. How much romance one character feels towards another. Um, how, much, how much one character thinks another character is cool, right? So these fundamental network values in the context of a high school setting of friendship, romance, and cool. And the idea behind uh, Prom Week is to try to uh, create uh, a framework for something that we kind of think of as social physics. Um, in the same way that um, physics-based puzzle games, you know, so as uh, you know, Angry Birds being a popular recent example, um, don't pre-script a specific solution to the puzzle, right? Rather, there's kind of an emergent space of possible solutions that come out of the physical simulation. We want to present, be able to present the player with social puzzles that don't have pre-scripted solutions, but rather a large number of emergent possibilities and emergent solutions that arise out of you know, some notion of social physics. So let's look briefly at, uh, at one kind of puzzle. Here we have this character, Zach. Let's say we've been given the goal as a player, have Zach date someone popular. Right? This is the sort of the, 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 the social goal we've been um, asked as a player to solve. Um, and we're having to do that against kind of a social landscape, right? So here, if we look at some kind of, you know, mini map of the social landscape, um, we see that Monica, um, is already popular, um, and that Zach has a crush on her. Um, we see that Zach has no romance for his friend Simon or for the bully Buzz, and that he's currently already going out with someone, that he's going out with Cassie. So there's two possible um, high-level strategies you might pursue for making Zach popular. One would be to make his current girlfriend popular, right? So then uh, now you've succeeded at the goal of making someone popular. Another might be to try to get a new girlfriend, right? And to get uh, Monica, uh, the popular girl, to want to date you. So let's say the player decides to uh, per, uh, pursue the first option, to make Cassie popular. Um, well, one way to try to make her popular is really to have, make her have a lot of friends, right? So then the player starts sort of, you know, uh, interacting with Cassie and having Cassie interact with other characters so as to uh, try to make uh, Cassie uh, gain more friends. But now we run into obstacles. So here uh, we see Cassie uh, uh, um, sort of trying to engage in um, uh, 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 a social interaction that is designed to sort of increase her cool factor um, with Buzz. Uh, and here, like, hey, Buzz, have you seen, have been by my locker? It's in a totally primo location right in the main hall. I have it decorated with all this stuff from, wow, this is really boring. I have to go, minus 10, all right? So um, this um, interaction failed to uh, increase the cool, apparently Buzz doesn't want to be friends with her, and this is, could be because, in fact, she's just not cool enough to pay attention to, right? Um, so then, you're, you could either, well, how would I try to become, like, more cool, so that I could get Buzz to become Cassie's friend, so that Cassie could eventually be popular, and I solve the, the social goal I've been faced, uh, faced with? Well, one would be um, to become the enemy of Buzz's enemy. Right? So it turns out Simon, who is an enemy of Buzz, if I can piss off Simon, maybe Buzz will like that, because the enemy of my enemy could be my friend. Right? And these are the kind of rules that are sort of encoded um, in the underlying uh, uh, social simulation. You'll also notice that we are using concrete dialogue um, in the realization of these social interactions. That's another thing uh, that we're, uh, we're doing with this experiment, is saying, can we create something that has a pretty deep social simulation, but rather than representing the interactions abstractly, represent them in concrete generated dialogue. So here we see uh, um, uh, Cassie saying, I usually smell you coming way before I see you, right? And that does indeed um, make them enemies. So we see little status effects popping above their head. They're now officially enemies. That was really mean. So she succeeded in pissing off uh, Simon, who, by the way, is a friend of her boyfriend, Zach. So, okay, now she's going to have some messy side effect happen with Zach. Um, but she has succeeded, at least in the short term, in uh, becoming the enemy of um, someone's enemy. And in fact, uh, Buzz is much more open to her now. Hey, Buzz, man, you wouldn't believe what an easy schedule I've got. I only have like one real class and everything else is just skating. Cool. All right, he's interested now. 
Um, let's pursue, and then, you know, many, many other kind of possibilities around, down that goal of making uh, CASI popular could, uh, will happen, um, or can happen. Now let's think of the goal of dating Monica, um, if I want to pursue that high-level goal. Well, you know, if you just try the sort of forward approach of asking her out, um, which is possible because Zach already currently has a crush on her, um, uh, that is not going to work. Oh, please, Zach, I heard all about the time when, um, when you told Doug that his clothes were so 2000s. Leave me alone. Right? And so, you know, where is that reference coming to when you told uh, Doug that his clothes were so 2000s? One of the other things we're um, experimenting with in the prom, uh, in prom week, is having the system remember every social interaction that you, ha that any character has with any other character, that the player has instigated, and the details of that social interaction, and that entire history of social interaction now further influences the social state and the evolution of the, uh, of the social simulation, and also is raw material for um, dialogue realization in the playing out of any of these social games. And so in some sense, uh, we want the player to feel like this game is really listening to what they do, and there's sort of this compounding history that keeps on getting worked in and worked in and worked into their interactions over time. Um, so uh, why is Monica responding this way? Well, um, she's going out with Buzz currently, so that's one obstacle, and she's also friends with Doug. And Doug is someone who Zach dissed previously. So now you can imagine, oh, well, maybe I want to start becoming friends with Doug. Or I want to break up Monica and, uh, and Buzz. You know, there's like sort of many possibilities for trying to overcome these obstacles. Um, so in this case, what happens um, is uh, the player engaged in sort of a series of interactions to lower the amount of romance Monica's feeling towards, uh, uh, towards Buzz. And once she had, that, that romance has been lowered by a certain amount, um, one of the possibilities that now becomes available from uh, an interaction between Monica and Buzz is to text message a breakup, right? And that is, in fact, uh, what she does. Um, so we text message a breakup, mission accomplished. There we see the ripping heart there. Okay, so now we have overcome one of the obstacles, which was that she was already dating someone else. Um, so now... Uh, um, uh, we see uh, uh, we see uh, um, Zach uh, sort of uh, flirting with uh, Monica and sort of bringing this you know box of expensive chocolates to her and so forth. Uh, but then he goes over to Cassie, his uh, current girlfriend, to kind of butter her up because here he is flirting with someone else. So now he wants to kind of you know butter up his current girlfriend and maybe try to you know smooth over any jealousy. Um, so he does that, you know, baby, you're the light of my life. I want us to be completely open with each other and show our true feelings and bear our souls. But wouldn't you rather be doing that with Monica? Okay, well, unfortunately, uh, gossip travels fast in this high school. Monica already knows about the interaction um, that she did. Uh, uh, I mean, Cassie already knows about the interactions Zach did with Monica. And, you know, boom, uh, she is not going to play along. She's pissed off. She remembers it. And, in fact, uh, tell it to the hand, jerk. This relationship's over. But that's an interesting side effect because that removed an obstacle for um, Zach to instigate a relationship with Monica. Because given Zach's sort of traits and current statuses, um, he's not someone who's going to try to date multiple people at the same time. So now that uh, uh, Cassie's out of the way, a pickup line's available, and voila, another possible path for um, having Zach date someone popular. So what I wanted to do with that kind of extended example was give some sense of um, the kind of sort of large and vast possibility space for social interactions between characters that fundamental kind of computational media research can enable, right? If you tried to do the scenarios that I just described and the sort of many possibilities that branch out at every point from the specific kind of high points that I laid out, you just can't do that by scripting, right? This is going to sort of exponentially blow up on you. You can't create that possibility space. You can't make social interaction deeply playable. And, um, you know, you need to do fundamental work on, in this case, I'm not going to walk through it, but here's like the high-level architecture diagram for the underlying kind of social AI 
that, uh, that underlies prom week. And this architecture is in some sense providing a new kind of tool, right? If you had your sort of broken crayons before, but you really wanted to carve stone, well, this architecture would be, oh, now you've got stonemason tools. <laughs> so now you can actually think about carving stone and explore that potential space of designs in the design space that you just couldn't con even conceive of before. All right, at this point, uh, someone might uh, um, be feeling sort of a growing uh, sense of, of angst and, uh, and um, dis-ease about the talk as they're thinking about, well, what about multiplayer games? Like everything you're saying seems fine when you're thinking about sort of single player games and you need single player game AI and so forth, but don't kind of multiplayer games completely break out of this box of needing kind of fundamental system, kind of uh, game system level innovation, right? Because, you know, multiplayer games are all about people sort of, you know, improvising within the rules and breaking the rules and metagaming the rules and subverting the rules and so forth. So um, systems level work doesn't seem relevant at first blush to multiplayer games. All right, two comments I have to that. The first one is that um, many multiplayer games are still fundamentally computational. So if you look at like Arkham Horror laid out here, and those of you who might, play, might have played Arkham Horror um, know just how many bits of cardboard <laughs> end up on the table um, when, uh, when you're playing. Well, Arkham Horror is a cardboard computer, right? I mean, this is, this is a computational um, artifact. Um, and a rather complicated one that players enact physically in the world by um, maintaining and updating the game state via all these sort of um, uh, state counters. Uh, further, um, even if you're thinking about sort of, you know, physical games and outdoor games, you know, as a, as a designer of such games, part of what you're doing is leveraging, like, the laws of physics. You know how things operate in the world, and if I'm like changing rules in basketball, for example, um, I'm going to change those rules knowing a lot about how my um, really good physics simulation, you know, the physics of the real world, um, operates in terms of how balls bounce, um, what happens when balls hit rims, the size of the rim that's going to make it more or less challenging to get the ball in, and so forth. So there's still that kind of systems level thinking. And finally, um, even when there's sort of subversion and meta play going on, that activity is not completely free in the sense that it's not unconditioned by the rules. It's actually that the kinds of sort of metagaming activity you can gain in, uh, that you can engage in, are actually conditioned by the rule sets and systems the designer has set up. And in fact, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, many kind of smart designers of multiplayer games actually design the systems just so as to cause and enable interesting metagaming possibilities, right? And that's why you see, you know, in the social games, um, in the Facebook social games landscape, that sense of social games, uh, uh, there's a growing interest in things like behavioral economics because uh, uh, people, uh, designers are becoming aware that, hey, you know, fine details of how we set up these systems, these sort of rule systems for these, for these games actually have profound influence on people's behavior around and outside the game, right? And behavioral economics is one of the, um, one of the fields that gives us insight into how to do that. Um, and that starts feeling kind of scary, actually. You know, this, this is where some, you know, as game designers, we start realizing, wow, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> Another comment I would have um, uh, regarding multiplayer games is that in the digital multiplayer uh, space, um, the, the primary form of social interaction that is enabled is kind of the speaking tube, right? Um, it's, it's basically a pass-through pipe where you have a game and then you allow people to be able to sort of, uh, you know, text and voice chat kind of on top of that game, but all the stuff passing through that tube is like outside the rule system, right? Is not being uh, taken, is not being taken into consideration by the rule system. 
And um, that's a huge missed opportunity when we start thinking about the dynamically game mastered MMO that I uh, referred to it on one of our distant peaks in game design space that we'd like to scale. Um, it would be extremely powerful in a, in a, in a game like WoW to um, listen in on player text chat. Uh, and to be able to detect things, you know, using uh, um, uh, uh, affect recognition technologies that are already being used to say like mine Twitter feeds and stuff, when two guilds are feuding, for instance, right? Then a dynamic quest generator could say, ah, I know these two groups of human players are feuding, let's create a quest where it's the only way to accomplish it is for them to actually have to um, cooperate to accomplish it. Or let's create a quest that's going to bring them into close physical proximity and see what happens, right? And, that, and so when you start moving away from the sort of speaking tube model and say, hey, you know, the game system itself should start listening in and paying attention to the player to player interactions that happen around a game and use those to, uh, to uh, modify, to dynamically modify and change the game. I want to uh, just give a couple of brief examples of other work uh, that we're currently doing in the center that hint at some of these possibilities. Um, one is work in data mining that we're currently doing. Um, so uh, one of the projects, which is in fact available out there to look at, um, this uh, 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 Star, StarCraft player called Icebot, um, is looking at how can we data mine human to human gameplay in this case, um, StarCraft Pro Gamer replays. So, you know, the, the very highest levels of human accomplishment in StarCraft, which, you know, by the way, those of you who play StarCraft already know this, but StarCraft is like as deep a game as chess or Go in terms of the um, tactical and strategic possibilities and the complexity of the game. Um, so we're sort of saying, hey, let's data mine humans at the sort of highest level of competencies playing each other to see if we can actually learn um, uh, for an AI player how to do those same strategies, micromanagement tactics, build orders, um, and so forth. Uh, and what this would enable, uh, ultimately, kind of the, the dream here, is sort of a, an AI player that tracks the evolving metagame that over time is able to say, oh, you know, this build order used to be really hot, but someone's come up with the great counter. So now because there's the great counter, you're going to stop doing that one and you're going to discover the new, you're going to start playing the new counter for the counter that's been discovered. And that, you know, you have this sense of instead of kind of a static player that kind of dumbly does the same thing every time, it actually participates in the ecosystem of sort of the evolving metagame as human to human play um, uh, explores the kind of strategic possibility space of the game. Uh, that same kind of, you know, there's a number of other data mining projects looking at sort of gameplay traces um, uh, that we're currently uh, exploring. Um, but one of the possibilities is in fact um, quest generation that's based on looking at human social interaction in multiplayer uh, RPGs. So uh, this is, yes, yeah, so, so it's not, you know, a completely kind of crazy dream to imagine the system that can kind of listen in on these pipes of human communication and modify the game dynamically. Uh, another line of work we're engaging in is um, formally modeling rules. Um, you know, at, at when you create rule systems for games, um, one of the things that makes game design hard and interesting uh, is that there are emergent dynamics that come out of your rule choices. And currently, uh, game designers have no tools or techniques for sort of thinking about and reasoning about um, the, uh, those uh, emergent dynamics. I mean, there have been design techniques that have been developed, but there's no computational support. There's nothing like CAD, right? So architects have CAD. They don't just have pieces of paper, and CAD helps them think through the um, possibilities of the architectural design space. What would it mean to provide that for uh, game designers? And so um, the image on the, the left there that says Drillbot 6000, um, that's a particular game prototype that was created in Biped 
Biped is sort of a rapid prototyping environment for uh, when you're doing extremely early computational prototypes that are sort of very close to kind of the board game version of your game, right? And this is a very common uh, stage you go through in rapid prototyping. What Biped does is provides kind of a, a high-level logical language for logically specifying the rules. Um, which, you know, um, and, and it's very, you know, a, a whole game can be specified in, say, like 40 or 50 lines of these rules. So it's very compact compared to programming in C++ or Java or uh, something like that. Um, and then you can play the simulation. Um, or you can you can play your little uh, your little prototype. Okay, that's sort of interesting. Um, but because it's been represented in this sort of hyper declarative format, the system can actually reason about the rules. And so you can ask your prototype questions now. You can ask your prototype, "Hey, is it possible for the player to gain more than five thousand resource uh, five thousand uh, resource in the first twenty moves?" And it goes off, think, 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 and it'll say no. And if it says no, it really means no in the sort of theorem proving sense of the word, that that is not possible to achieve with this set of game rules. And if it says yes, it'll give you a play trace and say, here's a play trace that does that. Or if you have a particular challenge, you could say, um, you can ask a question like, is it possible, is there more than one uh, play trace possibility for the player to overcome um, this obstacle? And it'll go off and, you know, yes, well, here's two or three or no, there's only this one, right? And so it starts giving you a little bit of inroads into helping you uh, much more rapidly explore the emergent dynamics of your rule set, which then is an enabler towards uh, the prototype on the right, Variations Forever, which is a game generator. So Variations Forever uh, um, creates, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of games abstract games in that sort of vector art style. And the game generator is using that same kind of hyper-declarative framework to represent uh, sort of possibility spaces for rule sets and to reason about the interactions of rule sets in order to generate new rule sets for the game. Um, uh, another and the last thread, I promise you, uh, that I will, <laughs> that, uh, that a thread of work that's, you know, very important in computational media research is authoring support, right? That if you're going to start moving, if you're going to move towards procedural everything, um, how, uh, how do you enable human authors to create games in these hyper procedural frameworks? You know, like I, I talked about the sort of loving hand crafting of, uh, of content, game content. I'm not anti-loving handcrafting. That's actually what makes a particular game special, <laughs> is that a game artist created it and worked on it, right? But now that loving handcrafting has to move to a meta level, where it's instead of being loving handcrafting at the level of, you know, scripting specific scenarios and lines of dialogue and, you know, specific solutions to puzzles and so forth, uh, now you're lovingly handcrafting complex emergent systems. Um, and how do you do that? How, what kind of authoring support do you need to provide? Um, on this screen, this is sort of a, 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 an interface um, element blowout of a particular, um, uh, of one of the authoring interfaces we're working on called Story Canvas, which is designed to allow kind of non-technical designers to author generative interactive stories. So behind the hood, um, you're actually creating a story generator as you work with this, but the um, the interface and the, um, uh, the metaphor for the authoring is actually a visual, visual programming language that looks an awful lot like, um, um, like uh, a comic strip or um, like laying out story panes. And so that same kind of storyboarding activity that a non-technical uh, um, story author may already be familiar with, they can use to author a generative uh, interactive story. Uh, and that's sort of a common theme in a lot of our authoring work is trying to put more and more smarts into the authoring tool to kind of facilitate the designer in doing this kind of meta-level authoring. Okay, so this brings us uh, full, uh, full circle back to, you know, what is the role of the university in the interactive entertainment industry? Well, um, you know, I believe the role should be to uh, engage in game studies so that we can sort of deeply understand the cultural and aesthetic 
um, uh, cultural and aesthetic possibilities and implications of the games we're creating, and to then, um, informed, deeply informed by, uh, by that understanding, to engage in the intertwined and intermingled computational media and design research necessary to create new kinds of games that we can't even conceive of today. And here I've expanded the computational media circle out to, uh, to a size that would make it a full partner with game studies and design research. So really, in, in, in the current sort of historical moment <laughs> that we're in, as games are really going exponential, you know, we are working on a media, a new, a new medium of expression, new technologies that will have as profound an impact on society as the invention of the internet, or as the rise of biotech or as the move towards green energy. And that academia and industry should be working together, hand in hand, to invent this new future of games, to create a future in which games and playable media fundamentally enrich the human condition that make us smarter, more insightful, and better human beings. Thanks.